Hello, everybody. I'd like to get us uh, started with our, our panel presentation this morning. I'm very pleased um, to have this, uh, this group and this panel here today uh, to talk with you about the Open SUNY Concierge Program. And um, Michelle Fort uh, is here as the, um, oh, now I forgot what it was, Open SUNY Student Support Co-Program Manager. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Yep, so thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you uh, to Alex especially and to Kim Scalzo for suggesting that we do this panel um, at the summit today. So I'm going to, I apologize to the people behind me. We thought this would be a, a cozier sort of setup and then I, without me lurking at the podium behind everyone. So we're going <laughs> to, we're going to negotiate it this way. It's like a fireside chat, kind of. I'm also going to um, truncate some of my opening comments to privilege time for our panel. I think it's um, really important that we use our time in this sort of face-to-face -face setting to hear best practices about the concierge model from three different campuses. The mo just to give a 20-second overview, the model itself um, is, is really engineered, is really sort of designed with the idea that we know that students taking courses in the online environment often feel um, a little bit disenfranchised from the home campus. So they're out there in the online environment. Who do they call for help? How do they understand what supports are available to them? Uh, it happens to students in our face-to-face -face environment too, but the online modality tends to exacerbate that. They do not have a physical campus to which they can um, to which they can turn. So the concierge model is an attempt to be that high touch point, one-to-one -one, um, uh, support service for students taking studies in that modality. And we asked our colleagues from Cross SUNY to share their expressions of the concierge model. What we found as Open SUNY has, uh, has uh, evolved, that different campuses are taking this role on in, uh, in different ways. So it's not a one size fits all. It's not um, you know, all of the community colleges do it this way, all the foreign comprehensives do it that way. It's really uh, an interesting way for campuses to meet the needs of their students and uh, the needs of their students, especially in programs in Open SUNY Plus. So we're very excited. I want to thank my panelists again profusely for coming uh, here today. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself. And then we, we set it up so that each of our panelists would, would sort of describe their model uh, and what they're doing currently. And then uh, I think we'll go to questions from the audience. And I have you know, some questions, too. But I really want to, again, privilege the dialogue. So John, why don't you? Start. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Um, well, first of all, my name is John Locke, and again, I apologize to those of you who are over there. Um, <laughs> I've never played in the round before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm fairly new to, uh, to SUNY. Um, I started in April at, uh, at Plattsburgh. My title is the uh, coordinator of the Technology Enhanced Learning Unit, and as such, I am also the coordinator of all the online programs, of which we only have two at the moment. Uh, we have a very well-established nursing program and a very small uh, expeditionary studies program, uh, graduate level. Um, and I'm going to focus mainly on our nursing program's con concierge model because they have, uh, they have a pretty uh, good size uh, online learning uh, population. Our expeditionary studies program only has, I think, six or maybe no more than ten students in the program at the moment, and uh, and so the uh, concierge model is is so personalized at that point that uh, you know it's it's uh, it's not as exciting to talk about as what uh, what our nursing program is doing. So uh, I've been aware of the concierge model for uh, for some time now. Before I came to uh, to um, uh, SUNY, I was at a small uh, <laughs> college in upstate New York uh, who found itself on hard times about uh, a decade and a half, two decades ago, and uh, they decided to look toward the non-traditional student, uh, what we're calling today the post-traditional student, as their, uh, as their savior, and in fact it did turn the college around. Um, they went after, uh, it was a hybrid uh, um, program, they went after um, uh, 
professionals that were looking to enhance their, their careers through, uh, through higher learning. And uh, because these people barely found their way to the campus, they actually created a group of concierges. They don't call them that, but that's basically what they are. And I saw how well it worked for those students. And so when I came here and learned about uh, this concierge program, well, well you know, I was, I was already sold. So when I first came on board, I met with Anawate Liam. She's our, uh, our nursing concierge. Uh, she has a master's degree in administration and a bachelor's degree in nursing. Um, but, and, and I asked her this just today. I said, you know, do you teach at the same time that you're working as a concierge? She does not teach because she doesn't have a master's in, uh, in, in uh, nursing. However, I think her students would, uh, would beg to differ with that cl uh, classification. Anyway, I just wanted to give you um, very quick, and I'm going to run through this really quickly, so if you're taking notes, forget it. Watch it on, on camera later. Um, what she does in a year. Uh, she's close to retirement, and this was really advantageous for me because she handed me a book that she's been working on for her, for her replacement. And right up front, it, uh, it has a schedule, the year, broken out by months and what she does. I'm not going to tell you everything because it would go on forever. But I just pulled out some, some, um, some more important tasks that she does. January, for instance, and it, it starts with respond to inquiries. And that's at the top of every month. So anybody calls, she responds. That's just a given. Uh, she updates the class lists weekly, contacts matriculated students by email who have not yet registered. She checks the student schedules on Banner, uh, sends email to new fall matriculated students. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to go through all of this. But anyway, so that's, uh, that's in December. February is a really short month. Spring enrollment uh, reports are due to the chair of the nursing department and she sends letters to potential May and August graduates about graduation pins, direction to the college, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I'm going to run right through here because I don't want to um, shortchange my, my colleagues here on stage. Uh, and by, by the end of the year, uh, December, she sends letters and emails to new matriculated students who have been accepted but haven't paid their $250 fee. Uh, she uh, um, sends out the first inter informational uh, email to students registered for the winter session and the spring online sessions before the end of the semester. And then finally, she attends graduation. Um, all of these things are, are uh, when I talk to her about why she's, she's doing these particular things, it's because, of course, her students aren't on campus but not only are they not on campus, but they don't have the wherewithal to talk, to navigate through the system. I mean, she told me that she will, if, if there's a student who wants to transfer credits from one course into the school, she says, send me your syllabus, I'll do the legwork. Any other student would have to go to the chair of that department and go to the dean and all. She does all of that for them. It's incredible. And, and as a result, I asked her to send me some, uh, some emails from students that, uh, that she had helped out. And uh, here's one. Uh, Carol says, thank you for your contribution. Without all that you did for me to help me achieve my BSN, I wouldn't be here. I, I am especially grateful for all the support and love you extended when I had my accident. I was ready to give up, and you helped to assure that I didn't. Another student writes, uh, um, Thank you, Anna, for all the help over the last five to six years through the RNBSN pro process. All the phone calls, emails, sitting in your office, taking chemistry tests for a year. That must have been some test. Uh, <laughs> you are an inspiring advocate for nurses in the uh, academic process and an invaluable asset to, uh, to SUNY Plattsburgh. I'll scroll down to the last one here. Um, thank you for your words of encouragement for me this past summer. Uh, uh, let me see, I lost my place here. This past summer, I really wanted to drop Nursing 327, but you told me I could do it. Those words really made a difference. I cannot thank you enough. Um, I think the testimonials speak for themselves. Uh, nursing, I've, you know, I'm married to a nurse. I have utmost respect for nurses. 
and I know that it's a hard road to hoe when when uh, when you're in a nursing program, and I think that uh, and you know maybe a graphic design student could find their way through the system without a lot of help, but in this particular profession, especially or discipline, especially, um, you know, concierges make all the difference. You're welcome. Hello, I'm my on. I'm on. Hope I, you can hear me. How am I doing? Good. Yeah. That's better. Thank yeah. you for the adjustment. I'm Karen Shuley Williams from the College of Brockport. I'm the Executive Director of Special Sessions and Programs, which is summer, winter, online, hybrids, off-campus, and transfer articulation and adult student advocacy. Uh, we are essentially, our unit is the last bastion of what was continuing education on the credit side at the College of Brockport. I'm the academic coordinator for our what was our SLN and now Open SUNY online classes and programs. And um, the concierge for us was one of my hills to die on. We started offering online in 2000 and we had to have Alex and Alexandra Pickett and Eric Fredrickson come to our campus three years before we offered eight online courses in the fall of 2000. And uh, part of this is my approach is that I persevere. So 16 years later, we created a graduate assistantship that just started in January. And we've hired someone, who, part of her responsibilities, and it's Renee Finnamore, uh, to be our concierge. She also is doing periodic administrative assessment for us, database management. She now is doing our online website, and she will be our point person for our outreach to our students. And so it only took me 16 plus years to get a concierge uh, and fund it. And we were given a set of questions to guide some of what uh, we tell you, and I'm a very task-oriented learner and student, and I did my homework, so I'm going to run through those in terms of the construct that we're using and um, how we've come about this. So in terms of what appeals to us to have a concierge and use this model is to have an identified, consistent point person to be proactive rather than reactive. As the academic coordinator, I responded when a student had a problem or we heard about or a faculty member called me and said, what do I do with my online student who hasn't shown up? Well, what do you do with any student who hasn't shown up? But well, there's a real disconnect because our campuses have always been based on face-to-face -face students come to us. Part of my background, I think, that helps me uh, be a little bit more visionary on this is I was also the executive director of our Metro Center and when I was at Finger Lakes I was the, the director of an extension center so the marginalized off-campus forgotten unseen night different things students faculty are my specialty and uh, uh, part of what we want to do is be able to improve our student outreach, engagement, retention, and we would hope for non-matrix, matriculation, and particularly affiliation with Brockport. They are extraordinarily isolated students. They're solitary. They can't lean over and ask their fellow student a question. And so this is a way to reach out to them as well as to bring them in and give them an identity with the college. Uh, by having our concierge, our grad assistant, we're going to be able to add capacity to collect and analyze data. Um, so who are these students? What's their track? Where do they get in trouble? How do they succeed? And then how do they compare to face-to-face -face students? And we're looking at using things like Starfish besides the Excel spreadsheet that I've been running for 16 years and with retention data. And it happens to be um, very good. Uh, we want to create a community for our online students, particularly the by course versus the program. Um, an example, we're talking about nursing programs. I have no doubt that any student in our, taking an online course in our nursing program is going to be in good a connection because they reach out, they connect with their students, and they're phenomenal. But it's students that who may not be in a program, particularly undergraduate, who are just out there floundering, very much isolated and alone. Uh, we're laying the groundwork for hiring a full-time concierge, perhaps, or an online counselor. 
And it was either at CIT or actually here in 2014 that there was a speaker who was a student services counselor. And he basically was um, trying to make the point that we need qualified counselors on our campus who are working with the online students. And he had a class of graduate students in the counselor education program. And when he asked them, in terms of your career aspiration, how many would you like, how many of you would like to be a counselor for online students? And no one raised their hands. But if you think about job market, this is a great place for somebody who has the aptitude and the willingness. And our graduate assistant is our, in our counselor education program. Perfect fit. Uh, and then also, this is a very cost-effective solution for us, and it has great benefits both in stipend, tuition reimbursement, and the actual experience for our graduate assistant. And I'm hoping it's win-win all around. And very importantly is uh, I hire and I'm looking for someone with the skills and aptitude not at all like me. When I'm on the phone with an adult student, I want to get them to the service. I want them to be uh, self-directed. And quite frankly, I'm not particularly patient with listening to their stories. And yet, they need to be heard and listened to. So that's part of the concierge role and to have the right aptitude for that. Um, our advising model at our college is, of course, the face-to-face. -face. <coughs> Come to campus. Bring your hard copy form in person. And so part of this is changing that. Uh, for a matriculated student, if they're an undeclared, uh, so they're matriculated but they're undeclared, they go through academic advisement. If they are a declared undergrad student, they have declared a major, they have a major advisement through their department. Matriculated graduate students have an advisor. It's the non-matrics that fall through the, clap, the, tra the, excuse me, um, the slots and the holes. And it's just like a colander. We use them. And they spend so much time and energy and effort often going in the wrong direction. So we're trying to change that model. Um, so for the non-matrix, our advising model was NATA. Um, and in terms of adopting this model, how has it enhanced or changed our approach? Um, we've gone from, some, from nothing to something. So this is the starting point for the College of Brockport. And this model fills identified gaps, and, and it will fill gaps we have not yet identified because we had nobody in the role. We're using the referral model. This person is not an academic advisor, is not the expert in any of the student service areas. She is the expert of knowing the point persons and what the student support offices do in reaching out to students and referring them based on the identified needs when she's talking to them or using Collaborate to have a one-on-one -on -one session with them. Um, part of it is building an understanding of the needs of our online students and then also sourcing that out to the college because we have a lot of units that it's not even on their mind. It makes the virtual or our out of sight, out of mind students um, real and hopefully eventually campus wide in the student service offices top of mind. So that's one of our goals. Um, where does this fit into the workflow of our overall campus? We are aligning it with existing systems and processes. We have a retention office that has efforts, the interventions for the first and second year students. We have a transfer office. So this person is going to be working in alignment with those folks and then any back, backside systems and processes, so Starfish, Hobson's through admissions. Um, at the point of entry, graduate studies, we are developing a way that students can, can toggle. I will only take this program online because a lot of our programs, the student can go face to face or online and we want to remove the impediments that the students face when they're online. You didn't send in your measles, mumps, and rubella. There goes your registration. By having them start at the system as identifying themselves as online only, we can then find them, our concierge can find them, and we can get rid of some of those impediments or barriers. Um, we built in the concierge model and our service, our quality service improvements and our periodic administrative assessment. 
uh, activity, and the concierge was actually a goal. So, ta-da, I have achieved one goal. And um, that came through middle states. It's in response to middle states. We want to automate wherever we can and, again, integrate into existing systems, not create our own. And um, it's nicely disruptive is how I look at it in terms of where this fits into our existing campus structure. Uh, in terms of student supports, it's a work in progress, particularly academic support for students. We do, for, through our Student Learning Center, have academic uh, remote writing that a student can make an appointment, submit a paper, and then by phone, be online, or be on the phone, or through Collaborate with the tutor to review their paper. The, the tough nut for us to crack is quantitative skills, the statistics, the accounting. Um, it's clunky, and we have not found a proctoring service, excuse me, a tutoring service yet that has satisfied our learning center director, who's also a math person. So I'm always seeking uh, advice if you have solutions to the math and the quantitative. And then we're documenting and reporting any and all need, again, to bring the online students, the non-traditional students' needs, and what they're saying they need and what we're finding and then responding to, to document that. So a lot of time, um, my approach, and happily our concierge, is data, data, data. She has very extensive skills in um, data reporting, analysis, and collection. And data speaks, as you know. Um, in terms of encouraging our students, the concierge is going to reach out. One of the things we're trying to set up first and foremost, if a student has not logged into their online course by the first week, but the third day of the first week of class, the concierge is going to get in touch with them because those are the highest students at risk in terms of falling off the face of the earth. And we want to bring them in, find out why they haven't logged on, despite my sending them a letter that says, oh, by the way, you are registered for an online course. Did you know that? But they might not be checking their email yet. So we have to reach out instead of having them drop off. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Um, we are also trying to get interest-based resource push to them. An example is uh, we have Get Moving Mondays on our campus. It's a national program, and it gives you tips like wall sits. This week was wall sits. Can you do a minute? So part of that is pushing resources out to students who are very isolated and letting them know where they can get this. We're overwhelmed by information, and expecting them to go and find this is a challenge. Another one, I think this past week, was um, U.S. Save. So it's a movement for saving and how you go about saving within your personal household. And for adult students and households, one of the reasons they're online is often about resources. They can't get to the colleges. They haven't yet. So we're looking at pushing um, sort of a special interest group idea in terms of resources. The training that we've done is we've been participating in the wonderful Open SUNY Concierge Group monthly. And um, also the Institutional Readiness Review was pivotal. I was waiting for it for at least five years to identify best practice is to have a concierge. And oh golly gee, we don't. Darn, now we have to have one. So um, we just are finishing that process. We've had our three visits. We're working on our implementation plan. And voila, we have a concierge. But stay tuned. Um, also professional develop one-on-one -on -one meetings with the student services departments. So part of the concierge's job to get trained is to go to every support service office, meet with a director or a designee to find out why do students need your office, what do they do here, and then plant the seed. So how does an online student interface and do business with your office as well as get service in many cases for which they are paying fees? So um, a lot of this is building up and getting the word out on our campus, this is a constituent, they are our students, we need to serve them as well because they're not getting any discounts on tuition. And they add a lot to our campus as well. Uh, we're also working with some new team members to our campus who have a lot of experience in concierge as well as the back-end technologies into which we'll integrate. 
and uh, concierge is creating a procedures manual. So, and that's always part of my succession plan. Could we please document this? Um, if you've ever had a secretary leave, you know it can be devastating. And for a year, you do everything wrong. Um, and that's where I started this model is I had our secretaries do a month by month, like you mentioned, what do you do this month? Because we are often units of one or two people with very little bench depth. And I'd also like to have our concierge have one, her last semester, we don't really want her to graduate, but that is a, ro a goal in terms of graduate programs. So we can't keep them forever when you have a grad assistant. And then have her work with the incoming graduate assistant. So that's um, a succession model that I've also used on social media, which I want nothing to do with. And it allows me to have someone else do it. Um, and then another thing we're going to do is uh, be involved with an enrollment management roundtable as a next step. And then, of course, coming to things like this, as well as CIT, to steal the great ideas that you hear from your colleagues. Okay. Hi, I'm Maureen Owens. Is this not working? Okay. Uh, I work at Finger Lakes Community College as the, um, my title is really student support specialist, but I am the learning concierge there. Uh, I've been doing uh, this job since 2011. Uh, Larry Dugan put the position in place under um, the umbrella of uh, NGLC grant. Um, and although I have a pretty nice template for my responsibilities, it is ever growing in uh, scope. So when I was thinking about how to best describe um, the various responsibilities, I kind of found three different components to what I do. Um, the first is administrative, uh, the second would be academic advising, and the third, pretty much all other support. So FLCC has um, a one-stop area where all students can go and really address all of their uh, administrative needs. So while as a concierge I may refer to the one-stop, I try to be the one-stop for our online students. So whatever I can <coughs> handle myself, I will. Um, my goal is to pass them around as little as possible. Um, it's, you know, community college students, and especially online non-traditional students, have really complex lives. And uh, the more I can do for them as that single point of contact, um, you know, the easier it is in the long run. So that's, that's the administrative piece. Um, as far as advising goes, um, I do have training as an academic advisor. I can advise. Um, in all of the programs that the college offers, uh, not just our online programs. <clears throat> so um, I serve as an academic advisor to new incoming online students. So that would be freshmen and transfer students. Um, these students kind of indicate in their admissions process that they prefer a remote appointment um, for that. So with a lot of correspondence, um, sending calendar links back and forth, um, we arrive at a phone appointment for their, their advising and registration process. And uh, that phone call, though we do achieve, you know, de determining a program for them and a course outline, um, that, that moment, that phone conversation um, provides another lovely opportunity for me to drop in a conversation about their online readiness. So um, I will ask questions like, do you have experience with online courses? Um, do you have questions? Do you have concerns? Do you have a computer? Um, which is quite often an issue um, for some of our students. They don't have a computer, yet they intend to take 16 credits online. Um, so we talk about that and the realities of that. Um, so that, that advising moment turns into more quite often. And then with that information, I can set them up um, to be more prepared before the semester actually begins. Um, and or sometimes, not often, but sometimes we decide together that maybe online courses are not the right option for them. Um, it, it's an important conversation. And then the, the third thing I mentioned was all other support, and that's kind of two-tiered. Um, I do a lot of that reactive, responsive, um, issue of the moment kind of thing, um, where I will perhaps refer out, but again, handle as much as I can. And you know, that's on a daily basis I hear from online students. Um, the other kind of support is more um, proactive, or I don't like this term, but like intrusive, where um, you know, we determine, similar to what you said, in that first week of school, who's not logging in, who's not participating. 
Um, and we've, we do this through our early alert system through Starfish. And in the second week of school, and sometimes overlapping into the third, but as soon as we can get, get this done, we call those students who are flagged uh, and either speak to them or leave messages. And this is a department effort. Um, I make calls. Um, Ryan, our director, made calls. Andrea, the assistant director, we all made calls. In fact, Andrea made most of the calls this time. Um, and we have found that this gets students going in their courses. I think uh, the data that Ryan provided me said 25% of, like we called about 200 students, 25% of them got their flags lowered and were back in their courses. So that kind of uh, very proactive uh, intrusion uh, is working. Um, other kinds of support that I do is, um, besides that and also in the moment things, is I'm constantly corresponding um, through an online student group in Blackboard, just sending out information, sending out reminders about things that are happening at the college, due dates, um, reminding them that we have online tutoring, reminding them that I exist, um, just you know, really making sure they know that there is a single point of contact and uh, I'm there to help them. Um, that's I've tried to keep this brief, so I, I, and uh, hopefully, you know, in the course of the conversation, more of the um, the details of this position, which that barely touches on, really, um, you know, can be discussed. Well, that's great. Thank you all. And so, uh, Maureen, I was waiting for you to end with "That's it," and I'm thinking, "That's not it. No. That's not it at all." Oh, right? no, no, that's this not is it. Really, <laughs> these are really. So, I heard a few consistent themes among and between all of you. So you recognize the complexity of students' lives. You recognize the potential for being disenfranchised from your campuses and from the students and students from each other. Um, I'm really struck by both the, the sort of the similarities and differences among and between your expressions of this model. I did want to say something that I should have said in the beginning, so I'll say it now. We're consistently using the word concierge for this model. I do want to say, um, and to make it clear, that all of the campuses, the model itself is um, uh, a sort of a spectrum of, of uh, you know, high touch points. And you've heard some, some conversation about that today. But not all the campuses refer to these individuals as a concierge. Some, some campuses call them advisors. Some campuses call them mentors. My home campus, um, SUNY Empire State, calls calls us uh, mentors. And the, so the word itself is less important, certainly to, I think, some of the values we've been talking about here. Uh, but, but what we do want to ensure is that students in this modality, and I'm, I'm really struck by the non-matriculated piece and the high risk, and, and nurses are balancing deeply sort of drawn and complex academic work with equally deeply drawn and complex professional lives, right? So those are sort of the three um, student cohorts. Uh, we want to recognize that those students and others uh, have someone to whom they can turn. And that's really the critical piece for us. Um, so just, I just sort of want to say that out loud, right? Um, so before, how, does anyone have questions or, or comments or observations? Yes, please. I have a question for all three panelists. Um, my understanding is that, Karen, you're using a grad assistant, so that's a part-time position? Yes, it is. The grad assistant, uh, the full-time graduate assistant, works 20 hours per week, and they get a nine credit graduate credit hour waiver. Mm -hmm. And John, your concierge is full-time position? Yes. Yes, she is. Okay, and obviously Maureen is full-time. So my question is this. How many students do you service? Does the concierge service? Do you know? I can tell you the uh, nursing concierge uh, services over 200 uh, at a time. And, and she's also there for face-to-face uh, -face students as well. Uh, when, when she does advising, she has her own number of students, face-to-face uh, -face students that she deals with as well. Stay tuned. Uh, so we're setting up a database to track and identify by student, by level, by type, uh, by program, by just off course, uh, what are they taking. And then again, our, the button gets pushed 
first and foremost is if they have not logged on. And then also building communities, so building communities for those students to interact in, special interests, whatever we identify as the need. We have over a thousand registrations and online courses each term and uh, to 1,500. If I, I have no idea how many of those students don't log on by the first Wednesday of the first week. So stay tuned. We have 1,200 online students. Um, 200, about 200 of those are fully online, but all of those, that number. Thank you. Um, so two of you, I don't know, if John, if you mentioned this, but about talking about uh, students logged on. So if your faculty bought into this, do you, because it is an intrusion. So, and do you think because it's a concierge model, they maybe would buy into this more than if, say, an online department did this? I mean, with, we would like to do this too, but to what extent is it a responsibility of a department or a faculty member? to check if students have logged on. Uh, well, and we work closely with the faculty. Um, we do have buy-in from our faculty. Um, they're quite appreciative of my presence and often seek me out to um, contact students on their behalf. But they are, they're use the early alert system. They use Starfish um, to flag students. And sometimes I, I don't really need to be involved in that process. It, it works within um, the faculty-student relationship. Um, at other mm -hmm. times, they, they will pull me in. To do. And uh, Karen, you mentioned you do it. Yes, we're navigating that because my expectation, again, is departments with full degree programs, and we have eight graduate full degree programs starting this coming fall. So we're ramping up for that. And part of it is to have a communication plan, to let your campus know and faculty who the concierge is, what that person's role is, and if faculty are using existing alert system, that's important for us to know and be integrated within. Okay. And they do. Okay. Um, and some faculty are, are terrific mm -hmm. about it, but as Maureen says, they're probably pretty happy to have the help and not have to, to spend their time tracking down students who didn't show up. And it's a lot harder when you might not be seeing them walk through your department. Just one more. Do you? Do you find out the reason students haven't logged in? Are they just not aware they need to do it? Do you get any data on that? I quite often do find out a reason. Um, and this is a myriad of responses to what that might be. Um, but yeah, if, if we actually make contact in the phone call, uh, not all students will answer the phone. Exactly. But, um, That's the other but issue. We quite often find out or via email. And it's, it could be anything, you know, technical, personal. Oh. And that's part of what the inquiry is in your outreach to them, is to say, we haven't seen you. Did you know the semester has started? Mm -hmm. um, that you're registered for an online class. Have you set up your email account, or are you getting emails and reading emails? So that's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we Thank are um, hoping to track that data. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I'm Melissa. Uh, okay. I'm Alicia Chase, and um, I've been teaching online at SUNY Brockport for four years now. And I, it's just a comment that I really like this idea because I think one of the things about asking the professor to find out where their student is is that it immediately sets the tone for the student to be on the defensive um, and makes them think you're going to be, you know, policing them or surveying them to that great degree. Um, and that you already know that they're not there and you're trying to, you know, make sure they're there. And no matter how caring your tone is, and if, inevitably I've found when I do do that, if there isn't, let's say, a legitimate excuse for why they haven't logged on, they'll make one up. And then automatically you know your relationship is going to be not just at odds, but it's going to be a dishonest one. And then you don't know where the rest of the five weeks, seven weeks, ten weeks will take you. So I think by even using the term concierge, it suggests this is a service. We're doing this for you to benefit you. And it's a very kind of objective, you know, thing, rather than the subjectivity that comes into play between the dynamics of the student and the professor, uh, which would happen otherwise. So I think it's great. 
Yeah, I think it's a it's it's really a team approach between the uh, concierge and, and the faculty. Uh, you know, when when a, uh, a faculty uh, when the professor knows that uh, they've taken it as far as they can, or, um, or you know, they especially in, in nursing where you know nurses are inherently caring and nurturing doesn't mean they're not tough. It just means that you know that's that's how they work. <clears throat> You know, I, I think that the cohorts of students become very close to their faculty members, but um, they have a different relationship with the concierge. Uh, you know, they might they might go to the, their professor and say, "I didn't understand that assignment," or you know, "My my kids all came down with the flu over the weekend, and I didn't have a chance to do the homework." But when it comes to something like, um, uh, geez, you know, my, my husband was in an accident, I don't think I'm going to be able to continue this program. They will go to the concierge first and foremost and, and say, you know, what are my alternatives? And, uh, you know, the, the concierge is really the student's advocate. Um, doesn't mean that, that uh, you know, the, the concierge is going to make excuses to the professor on behalf of the student either. But it's, it's a team approach that I, I think works really well, and especially in a department where, you know, where the faculty and the concierge are, are, are interacting on a, on a daily basis or, you know, on a weekly basis. And certainly in, in the nursing program, uh, they are. Um, I mentioned our expeditionary studies program, and in that case, our, the chair of the program is the concierge. And um, you know he's not dealing with that many students, and he's drawing them from the undergrad program. Uh, you know, so it's uh, it's it's more of the well, it's it's a male, so I'm going to say paternal, but uh, it's it's more of a paternal relationship between the students and uh, and the chair than it is what you would consider a concierge relationship. Thank you. How do you identify students who have not logged in? What's the process? Well, we have reporting um, options within Blackboard that we can find that out. Um, but we use Starfish, um, which is a system where um, the faculty flag students. Um, we can also, it, it interfaces with Blackboard, so we can run reports there. But that's faculty flagging students. How, like, like, report-wise, if coming from the concierge or support service, how do you gather all students who have not logged in, not in this faculty point of view? Because individually, faculty can see by creating the report who has not logged in. But like to support the students uh, for the whole program, for example, how do you identify those who have not logged in? I put in a help desk ticket and I say I need this report run and now I hope somebody can do it. So stay tuned. We had wanted to do this over a year ago but we were transitioning from Angel to Blackboard and our tech folks just, our IT folks just didn't have the capacity but that was on our wish list of a next step <clears throat> and ask me in a year. Well, we did this with Angel. We were able with the help of guys from iTech, we were able to generate a report um, picking up all the students who are not logging in. So our group, the e-learning group, our support service group, calls these students. So that was great, and we were able to do that, and I have to thank um, SLN at that time SUNY Learning, SLN, <laughs> and we were able to do this, and they did that with us for no fee. So now we want to move this into Blackboard, and for the benefit of anyone, maybe you'll hear this going around. So they're going to do this, and they're charging us a kind of steep consulting fee. So our process before was that we have some kind of a gateway process so that students are not able to get into uh, the LMS without doing an orientation. 
So they have to do uh, an LMS orientation. And with that process, once they pass that orientation, they are able to log in to the LMS. With that process, we are able to identify, single out, the students who have not been logging into their courses. So that was a very good process we had in place for like two or three years. So we're actually in the process of doing that. So if you guys are interested in doing this, I would really welcome collaborative effort and maybe we can have a little bit of a negotiation with Blackboard to get a better price. Um, I could add that one way we find out who has not logged in is by within Starfish we do student we do surveys we ask the instructors to please f let us know through these surveys who has not yet logged in and then we generate reports from that. We uh, we also used to use Angel in that capacity individually. Well, based on our experience, very difficult to have this go through to individual instructors. To make this really effective, you really have to be able to generate a report whereby students who didn't log in are going to be identified. And if you go through the faculty, it's not, I'm not saying it's not doable, but it's a, it's a very difficult process. So as I've mentioned earlier, we were able to do that. And we're now in the process. We, we gave our processes to Blackboard, and they put together something, and they came back to us, and unfortunately, the price is a little bit steep. I, uh, after, I just have eight years of observation of students that don't log in. And one thing I've been successful with my institution is getting the students logged in. But then you have this handful of students, usually no more than two or three in any given class, and in, in many cases, not even that. And the faculty just run a very simple angel report, tell me who hasn't logged in. And then the faculty basically, we've already done everything imaginable except calling them on the phone to uh, usually their cell phones. So that's what I tell, hey, run this report, and you know we've done lots of stuff to get them the information. They're not paying attention. And then the faculty call them on the phone, and they get them logged in, you know, when when they call. But these students are always the ones that never do well. So I I'm thinking, you know, what's really the value of hunting down these students that that don't log in? in invariably, they're the ones that are that are going to be dropped out of the course or fail the course anyway. So I'm sort of in this, yeah, you, you really need to, to contact them and to give them a chance, but they're always, almost always the ones that are failing your course anyway or are not going to do it. So what's the really the value of, of hunting them down? Because the same things that led them to not log in in the first place are the same characteristics that are going to make them do poorly in your course anyway. So. I'm sort of rethinking the hunting them down approach because it doesn't seem to work. Karen turned her microphone on. I did turn my microphone on. I look at this. Uh, uh, the concierge is part of what we do with the face-to-face -face student on student development and then also interventions. They came to your college in some capacity. They have registered. So it's about access and then um, identifying those areas that the online student needs to be successful. And that's part of our commitment when we accept them and also take their tuition dollars. And um, because they're isolated, it is so easy for them to be invisible and not found. So I think you have to make an, eff an extra effort because again, if a faculty member sees a student who's their major who didn't show up for their class in the hall, they might say, I missed you today, where were you? Uh, the online student doesn't have that benefit of proximity. And so I think this is one of the gaps that becomes identified. And then what are the supports they need? So again, what are the supports they need to become successful and to develop them as a self-directed learner and individual? 
So this is um, the whole student development model as well as developing them as learners that are able to be self-directed learners. It's a lot easier when they're in front of you than when they're 200 miles away logging into your course in the middle of the night. So I think that's our philosophy that you asked about, Paul, and it's up to each individual campus to say what is our philosophic and then um, operational approach to these students when they don't log in. So I actually just want to take, I'm, I'm watching the time. Alex, there's a clock right behind me. So I'm watching the time. It's always difficult being the panel that's standing between you and lunch, right? Everyone <laughs> says this. It actually is true, because I keep seeing the catering people walk by. So let's take one more question. And I, and, and I just want to acknowledge in the process that we have surfaced exactly the complexities of student lives, exactly the complexity of the concierge model, and really what we're hoping to do <laughs> for and with our students in this modality. So let, um, that's sort of my, my closing comment, but I want to take one more question. Hi, this is Adam Polipshin at Mass <laughs> Community <laughs> College. Um, just um, going back to um, student logins and the efficacy of is there an importance in that. And I think having the data first is the most important thing, because then you can see if there are any trends. Um, something that uh, I've been playing around with what my department has was we were looking at the limitations of BB stats and then we got access to um, be able to query BB stats directly. So I've compiled a series of SQL queries that you can look for pretty much anything that you want. Um, students that haven't logged in in X amount of days. Um, faculty that haven't logged in in X amount of days. It's not like we're looking at these. We're currently not deploying any of these, but the um, technology exists and there is no cost to that whatsoever. And you're doing a session at CIT on that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We hope. We hope. So uh, my students at UAlbany always told me that I routinely lied about when they would get out of class. I'd say we're getting out early, and then I would never let them out early. I just lied to you, too. We have one more question. Okay. <laughs> I just, sorry. I just wanted to find out for scheduling purposes. So if you're doing the concierge, I notice my students in my online classes are never the 8 to 5. It's always late after. So I'm on, and I'll, I'll answer them. But I'm wondering, when you're setting up concierge, do you account for that, especially if the positions are only part time? How do you schedule those hours? I, could you, I didn't quite follow, you mean like how do I manage? So in other words, uh, to, to schedule for concierge services for your online students, are you looking at maybe like evening to have the live person there for the students that you need to do a collaborate session with or whatever, or is it just eight to five? Because my online students tend to never be the eight to five questions or contacts. It's always weekends and after hours. Um, I do uh, like eight to five kind of day, mm -hmm. but um, I will respond to students in the evening um, email um, on weekends. I have responded in the middle of a restaurant. <laughs> um, if it's an easy kind of question, mm -hmm. I'll answer it. It's, it's not that hard. But that's not your scheduled hours, though, right? So what I'm not, saying is for not, in the planning it purposes. I think that's an example of a, uh, a structural, a high level structural impediment. And as those of you who are in the UUP know, they've started to build in clauses about on-call and paying people to be on-call. And this is an example that you have to think outside of the box. And since my grad assistant is hourly, part of what I'm doing is if she's going to be doing anything after hours, it's just like billable hours, you document. So this part goes back to, um, this is what I did, I spent an hour on the phone, these are the people I called, here's what's next, here's who I referred them to, here was my follow-up. So um, that's a really tough one in terms of people working from home because heaven forbid they must not be working if you're not standing there watching them work. But we have to get beyond this on this to your point. And so um, that's part of what we're building because we are also responsible from paying people, a payroll, an OGS, um, all of those structures to be accountable and you want to set things up so you are audit safe. And if somebody says, you paid this person, they worked at night, how do you know they worked? Here's the data and the, the documentation of what she did, with whom and how. It's a place to start. So build it so that you can do it.
and then explain to people what you've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's exactly Anna's model. She, uh, she documents every, every conversation, she keeps a log, and uh, yeah, she's at the students' beck and call if they need her after they get off of uh, a late shift. Um, she's available to them, but then I'm sure she probably shows up a little later the next morning when she comes to work. That's great, thank you. So a little bit of, of it is changing campus culture too, yes. right? So we're inviting a system culture. Yeah, sure. No, that's a fair comment. Right, exactly. So, uh, so we're inviting a neo-traditional, new traditional, non-traditional uh, student onto our campuses. We have to have concomitant supports and processes to help us support support them. So, and I think this conversation has really surfaced all of those complexities in 47 minutes. That's not bad. Yeah. So thank you all so much. Thank you for the great questions. We'll, we'll be here all day. I feel like we're doing stand-up. We'll be here all day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm sure we'd all be happy to help you think through this model. Terry and I, my co-project man co manager and I, are happy to talk to any campus thinking about this model. We invite you to talk to other campuses who already have it for established best practices. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle and John and uh, Maureen and Karen. Um, we are, are running a little bit behind schedule, but I want to tell you that lunch is ready for us. Uh, and we'll break for lunch now for about an hour and resume uh, in, what time is it now? 12.15? It's 12.50. So, uh, you know, at help. Let's say 1.30, we will resume. Yeah. Does that sound reasonable? And for everyone online, the schedule is moved forward. Uh, okay, great, thank you.